uh, keep on praying. Pray, pray without ceasing. Pray always. Amen. All right, we're in Revelation chapter 2 tonight, so we made it through chapter 1. And you, who does not have a handout? Let's start there. Stacy is on the case. Do you have the extras? So Wendy needs one. Anybody else, if you need one, just uh, raise your hand in the air. You need one, Amy? It's a new, it's a new outline. It's a new day. So um, we'll be in Revelation chapter 2. And if you're joining us online, we're glad that you are here. If you're Bobby Blaine, we just prayed for you and your family. And uh, we do pray that your knee pain gets better. And uh, if you're Leela Burton, we're glad that you're with us. And if you're somebody else I haven't named, you know, like, who was that girl that had the little thing? I see. So on, so and so and so. Uh, oh, okay. So Annette Jackson, it, we're, we're watching. You're, you're watching us. We're watching you. So, or God's watching you. But anyway, we're glad that you're joining us online. Any other online people that we know about? So Annette, we covered Leela, Annette, and we've covered um, perhaps um, Bobby Blaine. So um, anyway, we're glad that you're here. Oh, Randy and Julie. Cool. Who? Oh, Dan. Yeah. Wow. Claire Tanner, probably. Well, welcome, everybody. Man, it's a bigger group than I thought. I hope you're enjoying your Valentine's Day. We've had a lot of pleasantries in the house here, so... Um, we miss your fellowship, but we're glad you're joining us online. And uh, shout out to Randy and Julie. So uh, we're in Revelation chapter 2, and we'll just pick up the first seven verses the, this evening. And uh, we'll, we'll get into this and see how far we can get. So uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says here, Under the, the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and, ha and, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or, el or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And you notice there in verse 5 where it says his place, so it's an angel that he's talking about. Uh, verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou, hatest, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so... Uh, in this chapter, you'll note in verse uh, 6 that it's the deeds of the Nicolaitans. When we get over to um, uh, the, the, the church of Smyrna, or I'm sorry, Pergamos, uh, when that gets, they get married together, there, then there's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans over in verse 15. But we'll get to that later. All right, so let's do a little bit of review where we've been. Uh, we're, we're talking about Revelation, what we need to know before we go. Uh, we're on the, in essence, we are, we saw the introduction and the seven churches are introduced. We saw Jesus was in the midst of those seven, uh, candlesticks. And so, um, and, uh, we, we saw all of that and the end of chapter, chapter two, it's all defined for us that, uh, you know, the seven, uh, stars, which I saw us in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels uh, of the seven churches, the seven candlesticks, which I saw us are the um, seven churches. So the, the stars are angels. Um, the candlesticks are the churches. All right. So the first church uh, that which would be a candlestick would be this church at Ephesus. And, and why are we studying this? Because we want to understand the revelation of Jesus Christ so we can prepare ourselves to partake in its fulfillment as the bride of Christ and increase our understanding of who God is and intensify our, our urgency in ministering the gospel in these last days. So uh, there needs to be a space between our and urgency. I need to fix that. But at any rate, we uh, we see that um, we are the bride of Christ, and so God has given us a unique role here. Chapter 4 will be called out, but he wants us to know these things. These things, the revelation of Jesus Christ was given to John to give to the churches, and that's because the mysteries of the New Testament are given to the churches. So the mysteries are not things we don't know. They're the things that we do know. So we are given information um, because we are the bride of Christ. 
uh, Amy has information about me that none of the rest of you do. And that's okay because she's my bride. And so we have an intimate relationship with Christ uh, because of his word uh, that lost people don't get. Jews that haven't gotten saved, they don't understand all this stuff. They don't get it because they don't have that relationship with Christ. All right, so uh, and that should affect our gospel, right? We should, Because we know what's coming, we should get it out. So let's review on some things. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, we, what we need to know before we go. This, this provides the practical nature of this book. Um, wait a minute here. That is a slow roll, isn't it? Um, hmm. Okay, I'm going to let those. That's I'm going to let that roll. We'll get to those in a minute. So. Before we get to all that, I'm going to say a few more things in review. So we saw the history, the vision of Jesus Christ given to John as he was transported to the future written from Ephesus uh, sometime after his release from the Isle of Patmos in 96 AD. We saw the structure, which is the pattern of sevens written to the uh, seven churches in Asia. We saw the blessings uh, to whom to who uh, read, hear, and keep uh, this book in chapter one. We saw that this is an easy book to understand, but it's a hard book to what? Believe. That's right. So it's easy to understand Revelation, but it's often hard to believe it. And Jesus reveals himself to his church uh, in this epistle. So we saw that in chapter one. Now, by way of introduction, and I'll get to these points that are crawling up on your screen, um, we begin our study of the seven churches here in Ephesus. Ephesus was a powerful and key church. The name Ephesus means fully purposed. So this was a church that started well, but needed to return to her first works. So how easily we get distracted in, the, in this age of technology uh, where we need to go back to the basics. Isn't that right? So it's easy to lose our first love. And with all the information, it's important that we don't lose our love for God's word. Uh, Ephesus had, had good judgment. And when it comes to, to others, uh, but when it, the Lord encourages them to repent and judge their own sin and return to their former strength, he needed them to continue in the strength that they had. Uh, and so that's what we just read about in the first seven verses. So, Perhaps this morning, or evening, I should say, I don't even know what time it is, uh, you're not running at full strength. And it's my prayer uh, that this study of Ephesus will renew your strength. You know, in the, when we look at Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, we call it a mini Romans. And uh, Romans is a big, you know, doctrinal book, not a big one, but it's, you know, for the New Testament, it's a big book. And, uh, it, uh, and, it's, and it's full of strength, right? Like the Roman roads, the things that the Romans built. Uh, many of the things still exist today. Uh, and so Romans and Ephesus, it's, it's ironic that they both are books that, that build on doctrine and strength and are strong. This church was a strong church, uh, but he didn't want them to lose their strength. Maybe tonight you need to re renew your strength. And uh, and I know at times I definitely need to renew my strength every day. So the audience of Revelation is the seven churches. Uh, in uh, Revelation 1 and verse 11, we saw that already. And, of course, Jesus gave this revelation to John uh, and to give to us, which is, was to be dispersed to the seven literal churches of Asia Minor historically. Um, and so this proves to be uh, this uh, proves the practical nature of the book. Uh, so God addressed it to the churches of that day for, for their blessing. We saw that in Revelation 1 3. And he didn't address it to the church alone, by the way, with a capital C. He gave it to the churches. So the priority of the local New Testament church is also seen in this book. Um, and so and it has been the vehicle since uh, the inception of the, and the birth of the church to carry forth the doctrine of the church. It's a local New Testament church. He could have just said to the church, and, all the, and that means everybody that has a local church. But he says to the churches, the autonomy of the local New Testament church is, as you can see that practical thing there. It also points to God's method of preservation. Of God's word, God didn't ask John to lock these epistles in a vault for safekeeping, but trusted that the Holy Spirit of God would preserve this record through the propagation to all churches. Right. So uh, God did not commit His word to the publishing house or the bookstore; He gave it to the church, which is one of the reasons we have a, a publishing ministry here at HBF. Uh, those of you that were online, uh, we were talking about that. We just put out two hundred, which is nothing and compared to the people that were at the pray, but we were able to. Uh, turn around and get 200 John and Romans out today. I was telling Luke, if we'd have had an army, of, if we'd have had our Sunday morning crowd down there, we'd have easily gone through thousands of John and Romans within 15, 20 minutes. I mean, it would have been it saturated 
and we still would have been probably not making much of a dent, but uh, the word doesn't return void, and God trusts the word of God to the local church, and that's why you see God giving this to the local churches. It's not just John's to keep. He's not the Gnostic, right, with all the knowledge in his cranium, but he gives that knowledge out to the churches, and the churches steward that because it's a picture of God's preserved word. God preserves historically through uh, the church has preserved his word, and uh, and so uh, that's why we have the publishing ministry here at HBF. This also provides us God's perspective um, <clears throat> on the church ages of the past 2,000 years. So God has given a God's eye view of the churches, right? So it provides us a practical insight on what to focus on as local New Testament churches, just as uh, sin is common to all men and obstacles presented to the first century churches are surely going to repeat themselves over the course of the next 2,000 years of history. So uh, likewise, uh, we can learn much from the victories of the first century churches. And you often, if you're new to Heartland, you might hear me talk in these terms around here. If you're here very long, you kind of start to just kind of know what I'm talking about. But we often talk in terms of Laodicean church or Philadelphian church. So we actually kind of have a mental uh, checklist of these attributes. It's good to understand the, the, the things of these seven churches, because I believe any local church can wrestle with all of these things that and, and and be good in all of these areas in all seven of these churches. So we should always be evaluating ourselves by the lessons learned through Revelation 2 and 3 to the seven churches. Uh, and when it comes to prototypical churches, like which one would you want to be? You know, when, who do you want to be when you grow up? Um, well, Philadelphia is the one we often aspire to because uh, they 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 were a church that God used greatly, and that there was a door that was open to them that no man could shut, and uh, <clears throat> and so you'll often hear me talk about being a Philadelphian church, and there are some that would say, well, you, you, that's impossible to be a Philadelphian church because you live in Laodicea. We just need to be a good Laodicean church. Problem is that I don't see a good Laodicean church, <laughs> so I want to be a Philadelphian church, uh, and and that's also fulfilling. One of the things about just a very simple form, uh, I don't say that just to be contentious or, or what have you, but biblically speaking, um, <clears throat> what you see in the Philadelphian church is a fulfillment of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. They're coupled together, which I think is, 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 is very simple to get our mind around, but it's also very profound because brotherly love, right? Uh, let brotherly love continue. That's what Philadelphia means. It means brotherly love. So Unity in the body and love between the body is actually something that is evaporating uh, as the Laodicean church takes over. And it becomes self-love. Everybody, It becomes self-centered. Uh, not only do the churches become self-centered, but the believers become self-centered. And so the, the, the neat thing about the local church is we are a mechanism that God can use in these last days, if we do it right, to love God and love one another and fulfill the great commandment, the great commission. That's why I'm excited about some of the opportunities we have for outreach here at HBF. And God presses us to continue to love others um, as ourselves and not to be, get self-centered. So the Spirit here is addressing the congregation, uh, not the Christian, in a prophetic sense. So the exception to that is the Church of Laodicea. That's why this book is so important to us. We have been blessed with the promise that we individually, as New Testament Christians and as New Testament Church, will not face the wrath of the tribulation. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, the Bible says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I didn't give you that last one there. Um, and so, so we'll be caught up <coughs> um, as indicated in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, which we covered in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52, uh, where it talks about being changed in an instant in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and they which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. And so, um, and so we see our deliverance in Revelation 4.1 when John, who is a type of the church, is told to come up hither, come up hither. And someone might say, well, yeah, but historically that's not how they would have seen it. Um, I disagree with that because that's one of the things Paul was actually calling, uh, writing in First and Second Thessalonians to help them understand and straighten out is the catching away of the church because they were under tribulation. He was making it clear they guys, it's not the day the Lord hasn't come yet, and so um, and so you're not in the tribulation. And this is when this is what it'll look like when that day comes. Which then, when people get to Second Thessalonians chapter two, 
they conflate that to mean, oh, well, see, we're in the tribulation. Well, no, Paul says this is what they're going to see, and he even says they, not us. So there's these th- the nuances in the New Testament we got to be careful with. So we've read our text, uh, Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Uh, let's pray one more time as we bust into the outline. Heavenly Father, I just pray as we continue in this, uh, I'm now praying with those that are online. We pray that you would teach us all things whatsoever you've said to us. Lord, I don't have any great wisdom um, other than what you've given us in your word. Your word is truth. And so, Father, I pray you help me communicate your word tonight, that the Spirit of God would do the teaching, and, Lord, that you would be glorified. And, again, we do pray uh, for those that are hearing the word, uh, Lord, those that are are keeping the word. uh, Lord, I pray, God, that uh, we would receive the blessing from this book as you promised. We thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, Ephesus, the revelation of our relationship is where we are. Is, that's, that's where we're getting started. So you hear, you, I haven't shown you the seven churches of Asia Minor, so just take a moment, and on the screen there, you can see uh, the modern Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea, and uh, you know the Mediterranean Sea and Cyprus, and then over to the your bottom right would be the <clears throat> area where Israel is today. You see on the just uh, right above the O on Asia Minor is Antioch. That's Antioch. When you see in the in the New Testament, Paul and Silas were sent from Antioch. That's where it's at. And then Tarsus there, that's where Paul uh, hailed from. So he was all the way up there in Turkey. Um, Asia Minor is what it's called. So when they talk about Asia, they're not talking about China and, and uh, or, or Russia or India. They're talking about this section of Asia Minor. And, uh, and then you can see Iconium was a church. That's where he met Timothy. Uh, Pamphylia, and, and you got uh, these regions, uh, Phrygia, Bithynia. It's a good map. As you go through the New Testament, you'll see all of those places. Uh, notice that none of these churches, there were churches like Philippi across the Aegean Sea in Europe uh, and uh, north there of Athens, and you have Thessalonica. Um, but the churches that we're addressing and the ones that he's given uh, specifically to are these seven that are listed here in this part of Asia Minor. And uh, it, 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 it seems as though and is presumed that these churches are um, uh, really church plants uh, or works that really came from the school that was in Ephesus. So Ephesus is the first church mentioned, and also I believe was the, the place where Paul probably put the time in, and the other churches arose out of that. And so they had a relationship, kind of like our Living Faith Fellowship of Churches uh, and the fellowship of churches we here have at Heartland uh, that's even beyond the Living Faith Fellowship churches. So, um, and so we have this relationship that, that is established. So uh, you can see those seven churches, you know, physically where they were located, <clears throat> which by the way is a key place even to this day, isn't it? Yep. Istanbul, Turkey uh, would just be just to the north of there. And that little peninsula where it says uh, Byzantium. And so you would have Istanbul up there. And uh, just north of that is a war going on between Russia right now and uh, the West which mainly means us, the United States. So um, so there's reasons for all that because all of history is moving around and, and positioning for the second coming of Christ. That's why it's important that we study these things and understand what we need to be doing in, in these days. So I'm going to digress and get back on my topic a little bit. But just so you know, just historically, those are the churches. Today, not all of those locations even have have cities there. Some of them still do. And... Uh, and some of those, uh, to my, it's all, obviously Turkey's all Islamic now, um, uh, so I don't know that there's any local churches there, but there's some remnants of these church churches in some of those locations. All right, so um, let's talk about the re- revel- the revelation of a relationship. So I got a father holding his son right there, right? And so uh, let's talk about the relationship, Christ's relationship to the angel. So first relationship I want to point out in verse one, unto the angel. Of the church of Ephesus, and he says, "Right." <clears throat> so he's directing this to the this angel. The first thing you notice is it's unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. So each church is represented, as we saw in the introduction, by an angel. And this is not surprising, as we see Israel uh, is represented by Michael, the archangel. Uh, and so, if you have your Bible, turn back to Daniel chapter ten. Because this is this is actually something that you you should probably keep in mind beyond this study in in the churches. But as you get later on into the book of uh, Daniel, or I mean of Revelation, uh, these things can can kind of come back and give you some insights as well. So let's go back to Daniel chapter ten, um, and and notice this Daniel uh, chapter 
Dan, well, Daniel in general, you'll, you'll notice that we reference a lot. If you want to understand Revelation, you really need to have some understanding of the book of Daniel. So perhaps I should have a Daniel study and then have a Revelation study. But Daniel, is a, his prophecies, especially in Daniel chapter 9, uh, well, really not just Daniel 9, the, the end times unfold in prophetically in the book of Daniel, uh, which gives us the parameters for what's called the times of the Gentiles. And so, uh, which is from the, the, the captivity in Babylon in 606 under Nebuchadnezzar until the Antichrist comes, and then Jesus comes at the second coming and uh, returns and ends those times of the Gentiles. So the the seventh, the seventieth year that is prophesied, Daniel's what we call Daniel's seventieth year, uh, is what is in essence the fulfillment of the the seven year tribulation. And so we get that out of Daniel nine twenty seven. So Daniel is really gives us the framework. I should have brought out the board and could, I could draw that up for you. But at any rate, uh, that gives us the framework for which we even comprehend why there is seven years of tribulation, right? And God in his, in his mind already had that figured out, uh, but he didn't reveal that until the New Testament. And so that's one of the questions, that's one of the theological questions you learn in, Revel, in Romans 9 through 11 uh, that, that you can see the apostles had even in Acts. Uh, and we talked about this, I think, a few weeks ago. You know, they're saying, hey, when's the kingdom coming? And what's the, you know, in Acts chapter 1 and verses uh, 8 and 9 there, uh, you know, what's what's the sign of thy coming? When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he's like, well, that's in God's hands. Well, then later on in Revelation, he reveals it, and, G, and, and he gives that information to Paul. He says, oh, uh, the fullness of the Gentiles, uh, the times of the Gentiles are not going to happen, in essence, Romans 9 through 11. What, wasn't my heart's desire and prayer to Israel is that they might be saved. Well, God, when are you going to save them? Well, I'm glad you asked. He gets to Romans chapter 11, and he says, um, when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Right then, I'm going to restore Israel again. So I do have a plan to literally restore Israel. So this was revealed to the church in the first century. You know, uh, before 70 A.D., before Titus ever invaded and destroyed the temple and took Israel over. And that's important to keep us in track, so we don't have a false understanding of our role as a church and and get into what's called replacement theology. So we've known the church, the local church, uh, that God has revealed this information to in the very beginning. Uh, has understood and known that God has a plan for Israel physically, uh, and the church has spiritually got a, a mission to fulfill. And that's what was getting worked out in that first century. That's what you really see getting worked out in the book of Acts. So when you take what's in Daniel and you take what's in Romans and you get in the book of Acts, and it's like a it's like a transmission in a car. You know, it's, it allows you to go from one gear to the next in your comprehension and understanding of what God is doing. Because the Bible even though God's mind is is complete, right? It, the Bible itself that he's revealed to us is progressive in its revelation. And so God reveals himself to us through the word of God. And you can see as he's giving men and even nations opportunities to receive his message, right? He, he holds back and he waits for them to make their decisions. So in Acts chapter one and verse eight, he, we'll see how Israel does. Will they receive the gospel when you preach in Jerusalem? Will they receive their gospel when you go to Judea? Will they receive the gospel when you go to Samaria? Will they receive the gospel as you go to the uttermost parts of the earth? That question was up for grabs. God didn't just settle it. He let, he let them work that out. Some did, some didn't, but as a whole, they all rejected it to the point that Paul finally said, that's enough. I'm dusting off my shoes and I'm going to the Gentiles by the time it's over. Even though his heart's desire and prayer for Israel was that they would be saved and he would literally die. He even says, I would even, if I could, I would give up my own salvation for Israel. If I could go to hell and they could go to heaven, I would do that. But they, they didn't going to do any good because Jesus has already died for them, and they're rejecting their Messiah. So God uses Acts to kind of work that out in historical time, but also it's like a transmission. It gives us a, another gear to understand Romans. And so we understand, oh, okay, so God is going to, God hasn't, just because they rejected him in the first century, God is not done with Israel. So all those Old Testament promises that he made, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, but primarily to David and his seed on the kingdom, on the throne forever and the physical boundaries and all that in Ezekiel about all of this inheritance, all of those things in Zechariah. That's true. And it will come to pass as it has been written. Okay, well, how's that going to happen? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you the book of Revelation and I will show you how Daniel's 70th week will be fulfilled, which is the last part of the Old Testament that has yet to be fulfilled. Uh, for Israel's sake, and then uh, we will go on into uh, the millennium, and then we will go on into eternity future. 
So that's kind of just, I just gave you an overview of the whole thing. So that's why it's important to have this revelation. That's why it's important to understand Daniel and put all of this together. But you can also see that we can't understand revelation unless we understand the whole of the Bible, right? You kind of got to, we got to have some understanding. And uh, so we're back to Daniel chapter 10. I asked you to turn there. And it's not surprising that we see Israel represented by Michael, uh, the archangel here. Loan this in Daniel 10 and verse 13. Daniel's praying here, and he says, But the prince of the, the, uh, the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So we see in Daniel chapter 10 that Michael, he's an archangel, but he's also called a prince, right? So um, that's what it says. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, let's read that again slowly, withstood me. One in twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now, I'm not giving you the context of this. You have to go back and read this whole chapter. But Daniel's in prayer, and he's praying about what are you going to do with Israel? And uh, and these angel, this angel, Michael the archangel, shows up and actually um, communicates with him about that, and he's dealing with. Um, He's dealing with Persia. He's talking about Greece. By the way, at this time, uh, Greece was not a was not a thing. It wasn't a world empire yet. Uh, Philip of Macedonia's son Alexander hadn't conquered the world at this time. So this is all prophecy. You know, Macedonia is just a it's just a city state over here in Greece, and the 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 it's like it'd be like us, you know, not knowing about some little if if there was some Latin country, you know, maybe Brazil is going to take on the. The, the, the world, everybody's going to speak Portuguese. We don't even know it yet, you know? And so, uh, so we're, you know, that's kind of what it would be like. It's like in history, we don't, they don't even know about Greece yet. Not that that's going to happen, by the way, with Brazil. That's probably not going to happen, but I'm just using that as an example. And so, so this, this prince, prince, think about it. Where does that, does that sound familiar to you? When you think of that, where, do you, where does that ring a bell? Like in New Testament terms. Because we don't, we think about princes, we think about, Prince Charles and all this kind of stuff. Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Yep. That actually wasn't what I was thinking about, but he's the Prince of Peace. And then anybody think like of Ephesians? Yeah, principalities. Principalities. When you go to school, you got a principal, right? He's the, he's the guy in charge. So when you see the prince, these are people, these, there are spiritual forces at work. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, princes, right? So it's interesting when you see this. And so those are just some things to think about. Uh, why are angels involved? Well, because we affect things, folks. If you don't think the church affects things, you have no idea. Uh, not that we're that powerful, but you know what? We, the Word of God is. And uh, it makes the principalities and the powers take note. That's why the church has representation. That's why Israel had representation. So there's something to chew on. And I mean representation of the angelic sort. And I don't want to intrude into those things, right? As there's a warning there in Colossians, right? We don't want to get too far into the angel stuff because we don't worship angels and, and, and their servants and their messengers. But it is interesting that there's a war going on in the heavens over the prophecy of God's word and how it's going to be worked out. And so God gave Israel an angel. Uh, and he gives the seven churches an angel. Uh, and who knows, perhaps even our local church has some representations in the angelic world. I would not be at all surprised about that. So Jude, go to Jude chapter 1 and verse 9. Jude, hey Jude. I don't know where it goes from there. I never knew that song. But anyway, uh, Jude, there we go. The last book before the book of Revelation, the last book, and it's just a chapter, a short one at that. Notice what it says here in verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, that's how I know he's an archangel. I don't know that because of Daniel. I know that because of, of Jude. Michael, the archangel, when, <clears throat> when contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. All right, so there's a lot I could say here. I'll just give you some things. It's going to be a long time before we get there. So I think there's a reason that God has put this in here, a little deeper than just laying on the surface and to show that Michael's an archangel. 
It's also because it's in Jude, and we're getting ready to go to the book of Revelation, and there's eventually going to be two witnesses. And one of them looks a lot like Moses. So he gives us a little insight on the, so those tribulation Jews in days ahead will be coming, once they finally do realize they missed their Messiah and get into the Bible, they'll realize, oh, there's Moses, there's Elijah, there's those, there's those two witnesses. Michael the archangel, man. Michael the archangel's sending the message. He's a messenger, and he's a, he's a big one. Uh, he, Israel, uh, has, has, a, has an archangel named Michael that represents him well. And so God sends him on a mission. We, know, we don't see this in the Old Testament. And again, we have, adva- we have advanced revelation in the, in, the, in the New Testament. Scholars hate this, but it's true. Um, uh, because it's, you can't explain it. You have to believe this by faith. God gave us Jude. We wouldn't know about Michael. We wouldn't know about the body of Moses. All we know in the Old Testament is Moses goes up and dies. Well, there's no record that there's some dispute over the body of Moses. Where, where does that come from? Are you reading the Apocrypha or something? Nope, we don't. We throw the Apocrypha in the trash. Um, we get that from the book of Jude. Jude tells us that there was a dispute over the body of Moses. What is all that about? Well, We'll get into that later in the book of Revelation. I'll just leave that with you there. This is an appetizer. We'll get into that later. So we'll talk about that at, at another time. But for the application of, ex, of uh, Exodus, of Revelation chapter 2, and verse 1, what we see here is that, it's, it's, is that God is giving the church's angelic representation as if he gave, as, as he did. <clears throat> also, Israel as a nation had angelic representation with, through, through, and does have that through Michael the archangel. So if I were like the president of the United States, I would actually, that would be, I would like know that. Like, like when I'm making policy, when I'm meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu, I'd be saying, hey, God, hey, so if you're a president and you're listening and if you care, you ought to be going to the God of heaven. And Jesus Christ, you ought to be praying to him, knowing that whatever deals you're striking with Israel are going to be carried out through Michael the archangel if God wants them to be carried out through, through the, the diplomatic policies that are going on. Uh, and so that's that's a fact, right? And also, you're going to be resisted strongly by Satan himself. If there's a, if there's some events uh, that are going to get actually, uh, when Persia jumps in there and Iran is giving you fits and Hezbollah and and Hamas, where does that prince come from? Oh, that happens to be the same prince that's talked about in prophecy, the prince of Persia. So perhaps Satan is actually resisting you. Is it any accident that thousands of years later, the people that just attacked Israel were Persian in backing and support? Of course not. That doesn't mean if you're Persian uh, that God that you're evil, because God, by the way, there's a lot of actually good Christians. There was a lot of good Jews in Persia, you know, or uh, Esther, that story comes out of Persia. Um, but also in, in church history, there's been movements, and in recent church history, like there's been martyrdom, and 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 there's a movie out just a few years ago. Miraculously, uh, uh, this uh, this uh, diplomat gets saved by the church, the underground church. In uh, it's a true story in in Persia in 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 Iran. That's Iran, by the way. If you don't know who Persia is, that's Iran. And so, so it's amazing, right? How all these things line up. So just I'm just kind of giving you some things to think about some concepts here to just kind of noodle on because these things are leading us to the chapter four door opening and Daniel's 70th week and all of that. That's all, it's all still on. These angels are still working. And guess what? Our church has an angel and we got to get after it because we don't want him to spit out. Right. And so uh, anyway, I, I, let me get back to my notes. So it's not a co- coincidence that the rapture of the church will, tr- uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the rapture of the church that at the rapture of the church, the trump will sound and there will be a voice of what? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to look it up. Go to First Thessalonians chapter 4. Yeah, hey, you're giving it away up there, Ron. I heard it. All right. So when, when, the, when the rapture of the church comes, First Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, right? It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, uh, so that's an inter- that's interesting. So that's a, 
something to chew on there. So we'll hear the trump of the archangel. And uh, so something to listen for, right? All right, so let's, yep, come up hither. Yep, Revelation 4.1. And that, like in the old, and then you'll some could, may hear a clap of thunder, right? So Christ's relationship to the churches. Um, I'm still back here. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. No, I'm not. I'm wondering if my PowerPoint's wrong. Oh yeah, I'm behind. Sorry, kids. All right. So you you already saw those references. They're in your notes. There we go. So Revelation two one. So the the word the the world the world uh, the word I should say I got a typo here. Forgive me. The word church is found seven times in the first three chapters of Revelation. The word churches is found twelve times in the first three chapters. So the only other mention of church in the book of Revelation is Revelation twenty two sixteen. Uh, Nineteen times in the first three chapters the church is referred to. So that, that gives you something to consider uh, in the in Revelation chapter, uh, the, the book of Revelation. So the church is missing uh, from the discussion until you get to uh, Revelation twenty two sixteen. So Christ walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, as we saw in Revelation one twenty, and and so and that defined for us that those seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. And then he's walking because he is present in the walk of every believer. In Galatians 5.25, the Bible says, uh, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And so uh, he's in the midst of you. He's in the midst of the churches. And so it's a, it's an interesting concept there when you think about that. Um, and so <clears throat> we, we cling to the promise of Matthew 28. 20, which is a verse that many of us are familiar with, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. But the end of that verse, and I'm just quoting this, I think most of you probably know it. If not, you can look it up. What's the end of that verse say? And lo, yeah, I'm with you always, uh, always, till, even till the end of the world. Um, and so, amen. And so, one of the things that is important for us to understand. And the charismatics kind of mess this up from time to time, <clears throat> is that we are secure. The Spirit of God dwells in us. I mean, He literally is in our midst. So, um, you know, I was at a prayer meeting and some people were saying, you know, we're two or three are gathered together. There are you also. That's true. But you know what? We're in the New Testament. He's in us. <laughs> I mean, not to be, you know, I don't want to, I don't correct people when they say that, you know, but at the end of the day, you have an advocate with the Father. You have propitiation. You have direct access to the throne of God in prayer as an individual. All right? Now you take that together, that light, which is immense, and you couple that together in a group, and, and a congregation, an assembly, a, a called-out assembly, a local New Testament church. Boom! You are a powerhouse of, of prayer potential and preaching potential. And, uh, man, I tell you what, um, the church doesn't know what she is. She's, she's, uh, she's, I tell you what, she's lovely, she's beautiful, but she thinks she's an ugly duckling so often, you know. And the church is, is, man, there's a reason that Jesus wants to catch us away and get us out of here. And I think one of the things we'll be saddened about oftentimes when we get to the, I think when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, both as individuals and then probably me as a pastor, will just be the unmet potential of the local church, you know. Because our, we, we, I mean, he's with us, he's in us. I mean, it's amazing. And so uh, just think about that relationship with the church. And so just in a practical way, as he's given the Great Commission there in Matthew 28, he just says, hey, lo, I am with you all the way, even to the end of the world. I mean, there's nothing that's going to separate us from the love of God. And so uh, you can think about that first century church. You remember, you remember how the church met and the first night, the Sunday night prayer meeting? You remember what kind of condition was the church in? in, in Huh? Huh? Afraid. Yes, thank you. I couldn't hear you. So they were afraid. They were fearful. And then what happened? Je Jesus, boom, oh, he just shows up in the midst of them. And he says, hey, peace, man. Relax. I got this. <laughs> He's there. 
And it's kind of like that with us. Like we're, we're rolling through church and we just, we're going through the motions. And every so often, I mean, Jesus is with us anyway, but every so often he really manifests himself just to say, hey, I'm with you, you know, relax. I got this. And so we just need to remember that he is with us. And, and uh, that is an important thing in every, in every uh, church age and in every local New Testament church. It's important to understand our relationship and Christ's relationship to the church. So no doubt Jesus works through the church and individual local New Testament churches, and he does it even today. Uh, he does it today as well. All right, so let's talk about Christ's relationship to our works. So um, the phrase, I know thy works, is found seven times in the Bible. Each case is in reference to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And that phrase is... is uh, Therefore, it is, is reserved for this section of Scripture and for these churches. That tells us something. That, you know, some people are like, man, that church will work you to death. Why? Because that's what we're here to do is get the work done. Now, I'm not, not to the exclusion of the relationship or the Spirit of God, but Pastor Randy, man, when he, if you listen carefully what he was saying in his last address to the church, one of the things he was imploring us to do is do the work. I mean, do the work. Do the work. There's work to be done. And we got to do the work because that's what God expects us to do. That's what we're here to do. What made you go back in the Old Testament? What made what made Ruth so virtuous? Obviously, her faith. She was a worker in the field. I mean, everybody just stepped back and they're like, "Who is this lady? <laughs> she is a worker, right?" Well, that's because she's a picture. She's a type of the church. <laughs> everybody was impressed with her work. She was a laborer, and that's what we are. When you look at Song of Solomon, you know what they're doing? They're flirting and they're dancing around, looking through the lattice. What are they doing? Well, they're vine, they're, they're vine dressing, right? There's, there's work to be done there anyway. Um, so the, the phrase, I know thy works, is found seven times. And so this sheds new light on, on a couple other uh, key New Testament verses, uh, one of which is Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, it says, for we are his workmanship. Uh, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And amen and amen that we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Get that straight. Salvation is, is not in our work. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he did. But and, get this, we're saved unto good works. There is work to do once you get saved. Once you're in the family of God, uh, that is why we must mature. That's why we're a discipleship church. We desperately need people saved. We desperately need people discipled. And we need people that can, can grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that work isn't just done. And when you think of work, oftentimes, and you hear it from me, you're probably thinking, yeah, I need to, I need to get, the, I gotta get the ball fields ready for Christ Soccer Academy. Or I've got to go work over here in the, in the children's ministry. Or I, I've gotta, uh, I'm looking around the room here. I've got to work in the sound booth. Uh, I've got to clean the church on Sunday. I got to get up and play my instrument and praise. I, I got to disciple someone. I've got to, there is all these things and that is all work for sure. All of those things are, are work, but it's also the work that we do in, in the, in the home, right? In our marriages, in our relationship with our children, in our community. And, uh, and, and God is working through all of those things and there's work to be done, right? One of the things we do in the IGO ministry, intentional gospel outreach uh, our, our pastoral IGO group, we pause every once a month just to say, hey, how are we doing in the work, and it's work, of evangelism, right? Are we evangelizing our neighbors? Uh, are, we, are we looking for open doors? You know, I was just thinking of that today. We just had an altercation in our neighborhood. I don't think you know about that, Amy. Did you hear about that? Yeah, so I'm like, oh boy, there's work to be done. I got to mend a relationship. One of the neighbors yelled at my son, and my son yelled at him. I'm like, oh boy, we got to fix that. Uh, and so I won't get into who was just or not, but of course I lean toward my son. But anyway, uh, it was just, you know, neighborhood stuff. But, uh, you know, it happens. Why? Because there's work to be done. The gospel needs to go out, and we got to get the work done. All right, so there's, we're saved unto good works. In addition, this passage, uh, in, to this passage, I, I always quote, I've, I've found at least 19 references in the New Testament that speak uh, of the fruit of salvation being good works. And so our labor in the Lord is not in vain. It is not only to our benefit, but to the benefit of the body of Christ. And ultimately, it glorifies the Lord. And he looks at us and he's like, 
that looking good, Ruth. I can't believe God gave you to me. Now, we, God's not really like that with us, but in essence, that's kind of the image that's painted through the picture of Ruth and Boaz. Boaz is thankful for this virtuous woman that he's received. He's not. He's like, wow, you know, you could have got a lot of younger men, and uh, and so on and so forth. I, I'm thankful that you. Sure, I mean, yeah, I'll I'll take on the responsibility of fulfilling the role of the kinsman redeemer, and so praise God, Jesus Christ has taken on the role of redeeming us, though we are like the Moabites, right, and we're grafted in by grace through faith. So Christ knows what's going on in His churches, and Satan is not omnipresent. That's something I need to tell you, that he is not omnipresent. God is. Uh, And so this is why we should observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper with biblical reverence, right? So uh, God's omnipresent, but Satan is not. That also helps you as we get into the book of Revelation. I can't help myself as you think about technology. I just came through a book on AI technology, which is an old book, uh, and the development of AI technology. So the technology is is the devil's response to not being omnipresent. And so um, we use technology, but you can't trust it. Just keep that in mind. You, you use it, but you can't trust it, right? So it's like, you know, it's like your house. Keep some candles. You use electricity, but you can't trust it. Amy and I were just talking about that the other day. Sharon really knows. She lived in Guatemala. You really can't trust the electricity in Guatemala. <laughs> so, um, uh, but you use it when you have it. <laughs> so I'm not saying you can't use technology. But just remember that don't trust it because that's a foe. It's it's ultimately going to be how the devil tries to be omnipresent. And the technology continues to advance uh, so that he has a system and a network to rip off the Holy Spirit. All right, so let's move on. So point B, um, recognition of the good work. What's all this about? Now we end our, our 16th lesson in discipleship. What's that about? The judgment seat of Christ, right? So, um, <clears throat> Revelation 2, uh, let's move on to the next verse. I'm, going, I'm moving kind of slow here, but um, it's okay. We'll get, we'll get going here. So, Revelation uh, 2, verse 2, he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. When you see the word patience, you know there's suffering involved, typically. <clears throat> and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and has tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. So their work has borne out some discernment. Uh, their work has borne out discernment. In verse 3 it says, and has, and, and has borne, right, and has patience. And he brings up that patience a second time. Right? You guys have bore the weight, and you've been patient, and, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So he's acknowledging the difficulties that they've been through. Now jump down to verse 6. He says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. So there's some things that that, that, uh, he's encouraged in and some things that he hates. And, you know, this is a practical thing. This is worth coming tonight. This is something I need to hear uh, if you don't, but it reminds me of this. right? You want to love what God loves and hate what God hates. You know, one of the things, when you look at that, again, you talk about principalities and powers. Uh, Job is a picture of Israel in the tribulation period, right? All right? You got a picture there. And you got and you got angelic. You got, I mean, you got, you're not even just dealing with angels now. You're dealing with God and Satan. Right? And it's about his patience and suffering. Uh, and so God says, you know, uh, one of the things about Job that I like is that he escheweth, the word we don't use much, escheweth evil. You know what that means, escheweth? What's that? Anybody translate that for me? Huh? Turns it away? Yeah. What else? Reject it? Yeah, there's a, there's a sense of, of just a hatred. It's, it's not just like, yeah, he doesn't like evil. I mean, he hates it. He rejects evil. He turns from evil. And so God is pleased with Ephesus in their labor and their work and their patience and dealing with all that. It has given them some discernment of some things that they need to hate. And they're like, you know what? We, I hate, God says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and you do too. I like that. I like that about you. You hate what I hate, right? People, I mean, that's hard. In the Laodicea, God forbid we actually say that God hates anything because that's like, that's not permitted 
uh, one of the knocks on the Super Bowl commercial, right? You got Jesus washing some pervert's feet, you know, and and, and so a lot of the Christians are like, and it's yeah, it's twisted, and God will use it anyway. But at the end of the day, God is holy, right? And and yes, yeah, He washed His disciples' feet, <laughs> but His disciples had followed Him, and He's getting ready to celebrate the Passover with them and show them what the Lamb is all about, right? And and so. They followed him faithfully. They're the only ones with him in the upper room. Uh, and so he has to die on the cross for the sins of all of the all of us perverts before we can become disciples and then get our feet washed and comprehend the magnitude of his sacrifice. So it is important to get those things straight, right? And of course, what do you expect from the world? You know, whatever. Um, so I'm not mad about it. I don't, I'm not going to write a blog post over it. I don't care. It's like, I don't know. I'm glad they showed some something halfway. It's a lot better than what, what the other junk they had out there. That was for sure. So, um, but at any rate, I don't go to the Super Bowl commercials to get my theology. So it doesn't bother me in the least. But <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, it could have been worse. Let me tell you. So uh, Ephesus had good works, right? They were a busy church. In uh, his book on Revelation, John Phillips uh, describes the church of Ephesus like this. Um, and so if you were going to drop in on the church at Ephesus on a Sunday and visit, here's, here's what it might be in the announcements. Uh, immediately after the service, we'll be praying together. Uh, the sisters will meet in the annex next door. The brethren will meet at the patio outside. At 11 o'clock, the family Bible hour will begin. And the Sunday school divisions of the family hour will meet in the school of Ty- Tyranius across the street. The adults will, will meet here. The gospel will be preached this morning by our brother Alexander Cyrene, our aged brother uh, is the son of the well-known Simon who carries the cross for who carried the cross for our Lord and who joined in Paul's original uh, commendation to the mission field. We are privileged to have our brother <clears throat> from Alexander uh, with us today. He will be uh, also speak tonight at our evening service at 7 p.m. This does sound like Heartland, doesn't it? This uh, afternoon at 2:30 uh, will be a street meeting uh, to be conducted outside the Temple of Artemis. Uh, Christians in the fellowship will recall that this. A uh, weekend brings many pilgrims to Ephesus to partake in the pagan festival called Super Bowl. I mean, uh, Arm- uh, Armidus. Uh, uh, we suggest that those who, who like Gideon's 22,000, are afraid to get involved should stay home. Uh, we only want those who are activated by the holy boldness to attend. Amen. I like this. I'm ready to go to Ephesus. And so the young people's meeting will be uh, will convene at 4:30 p.m. Brother Simon uh, Ben Joseph from Jerusalem will be giving an uh, illustrated talk on the Holy Land. There'll be a choir practice after the service this evening. Brother David Bencora has written a new Christmas cantata. All choir members should make a special effort to attend since parts of the cantata are to be assigned this afternoon. The track club will meet in the, in the uh, home of Brother Hermes uh, tomorrow night. A new tract has been received from uh, Brother uh, Marcellus of Rome. All who can uh, wield a pen will be needed to begin making copies of this tract for distribution, of course, because they didn't have a printing press. uh, The weekly prayer meeting will be held Tuesday evening. Uh, We need to pray earnestly for the activities of the church. Last week, week attendance at the prayer meeting was very poor. Uh, The weekly Bible class meets one hour after sundown on Wednesday evening. We are studying the Apostle Paul's epistle uh, to the Romans. Uh, those who possess a copy of this scroll are requested to bring it to the meeting. There will be uh, there will be an elders meeting at the close of the Bible class. All <clears throat> all elders should uh, make a special effort to be present. We're going to have an interview with James of Antioch, who claims to be an apostle. Uh, a deacons meeting will be held this week in the home of Sister Phoebe. The sisters are sewing uh, for Brother Gaius and his family, uh, serving the Lord in Egypt. Um, the youth cha- the youth challenge rally will be held Saturday near Bonfire Square, which, by the way, we're having a bonfire this Friday for real. Uh, the youth ch- <laughs> so we're expecting young people to be with us from Sardis, Thyatira, and Philadelphia. The young challenge uh, speaker will be our honored brother Fortuna- uh, Fortunatus, who was recently condemned to die in the arena at Rome, but who was reprieved at the last moment. There'll be a potluck supper on Saturday. The sisters will uh, s- uh, see my wife about the food. Let us try to bring uh, our unsaved friends and neighbors to the supper. There will be a testimony meeting after the meal. Whew, you getting tired yet? Yeah, I think this is all the announcements. Oh, uh, what's that, my dear? Yes, I should have mentioned that there will be a baptism class for new Christians after the prayer meeting on Tuesday evening. Whew. That does sound a lot like HBF. 
<laughs> so they were a busy church. They're working and they're getting it done. So the church had many things to do. So uh, that's a little funny, but it, it is indicative of a church that's busy. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and we resemble that type of, of, uh, of pace here at HBF. You know, six to seven days a week. I would probably, I, I mean, seven days a week, there's stuff going on at Heartland. You know, just as the way it is. Nothing wrong with that. I'm glad for that. Uh, but Ephesus, uh, they did have a good work. They had a good labor. And, and so it, it would appear that their labor his, uh, was historically off to a good start. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Uh, th- these were folks that labored. Of course, that's the Thessalonica, but these in Ephesus labored as well. And it's remembered of the Lord. It was in Ephesus that, that many believe, uh, believers were freed from the bondage of Judaism. If you have your Bible, turn back to Acts chapter 19. Uh, look at Acts 19. And I just want you to see uh, historically some of the things there in Ephesus. Uh, Acts chapter 19 and verse 1 says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And, and they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Uh, and he said unto them, unto, uh, unto what then are you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should be, believe on him which should come after him, that is on, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul, uh, then when, I'm sorry, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue, and by the way, obviously a Jewish audience, that's why there's signs to accompany the message. Um, and, uh, and so then they go into the synagogue, a Jewish, Jewish house of worship, and he spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Uh, but when the diverse were hardened and believed not, again, he goes to the Jew first, he, uh, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of Tyrannus. And so this is where we get the school of Tyrannus, which was just mentioned in that little funny that I read. Uh, this continued by the space of two years. So that here it comes. So then th- that all they which were dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So this really was a busy church. This was a church that was making an impact in those seven churches that I, I brought up earlier. And I believe it was because of this, this time that Paul was investing in the school of Tyrannus. He said, that's fine. If the Jews won't receive it, I'll go to the Gentiles. And, the, and, and man, that spread like wildfire. And there were disciples. So there were Jewish probably disciples that followed him out of the synagogue and helped him establish this church at Ephesus. And this church at Ephesus uh, got the word of God, uh, the word of the Lord Jesus to, to, it says, unto all of Asia. I mean, they were, they were heard in Asia. And, and, and then it says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto, unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. So Paul was being um, recognized there as an apostle. God was giving him a, a unique ability to heal and what have you uh, in that first century. Uh, and, of course, those went away with the completion of the New Testament. But uh, the point isn't those gifts. The point is that God was doing a good work there. Um, and so something was lost, though, in all of that activity. Uh, we do not see the blessing on the church of Ephesus because they lost their first love. So I took you back to that because I want you to see really how they got started. <clears throat> we do not see the blessing on that church of Ephesus because they, they lost this first love. So Paul would later write to the Ephesians and, he, and, and prayed they would have more light and more love. And so I put it on the, on the screen there, Rev, Ephesians chapter 3. You're going to have to turn there. I don't have it uh, you know, on the screen. Ephesians chapter 3. Look over there in verse 17. So we're just looking at this as in a historical context, and it'll hope, up, uh, open up our eyes to 
you know, what was really going on in that church age as well. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17, the Lord says uh, through Paul here, he says uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. Um, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that she might be filled with all the fullness of God. So being busy wasn't enough. They needed to grow in, in love, right? That's what he tells them. And not just there. He, he, he talks about edify one another in love. That comes from Ephesians, right? So he's very interested in them being uh, rooted and grounded in love. They had lost their first love, which gets you back to the great commandment, loving God and loving people. You can get so caught up in the activity that you love what you're doing more than you love the God that you're doing it for and the people that you're doing it with. And so that, that you got to be careful of that in an industrious church. And, you, and if you've been around very long, you'll, still be, you'll, you'll see when people get that out of whack, it's like throwing a bearing, man. It'll just stop the car eventually. The motor will break because they lose their first love. Yes, sir. Yeah. Spirit. Yeah, love. Charity. Never fails. First uh, first evidence of the Spirit there. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Amen. So um, Ephesus had endured trials of, of, of faith, which is where that patience comes in. And in Romans 5.3, it says, and not only so, but, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So he wasn't, uh, they did endure a lot, and he was commending them for that. They were a tough church. Ephesus had tried those who were false. Uh, that's also a commendation. And so uh, in Acts 20, 29, Paul wrote to the Corinthians because the need was present to protect the, the church from wolves. And in Acts 20, 29, he says, For I know this, that after my departing, Shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock? Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Now, those could have perhaps even been Nicolaitans that would do that. Um, in Corinth, in, in chapter 14 and verse 37, he says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Um, in 1 John 4, 1, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they, they uh, are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. <clears throat> and so uh, there's a need to try those who are false. And that's what the church at Ephesus did. It's recorded in verse 6 of chapter 2 that they agreed with God about those Nicolaitans. Nico means to, to overthrow, and, and uh, Laos it means the laity. So these were overthrowing the lady. Nico comes from the Greek word Nike, which means victory, right? Uh, that's a Greek word. Uh, Nike means victory. So Nicolaitans were overthrowing. They were victorious over the laity, uh, which that's not who we're fighting, right? And so we follow Jesus' example. In Philippians 2, 7, the Bible says, But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So this activity has gone on uh, <clears throat> and is present today in the Roman church, this Nicolaitan system, as well as uh, other churches that believe in apostolic succession. So just historically what's going on, if you look at it in a church history perspective, uh, before the first century is over, <clears throat> there are these, uh, these that believe in knowledge, Gnosticism that end up elevating themselves above the laity. And of course, as we just read in that funny that, you know, getting to scripture places was harder back then. You had to write it all out. So you had to be learned. You had to be able to write it out. And, and uh, there were people that were lording themselves over the laity. So next week when we come back, we'll pick up um, the rebuke that has, the Lord has for them uh, for wondering in uh, verses four and five. So, that's where we're going to stop for tonight. And then we'll uh, hopefully I'll be able to continue on into chapter the next church as well. So um, I'll be prepared for that. We'll see how far we get. So I didn't mean to, I was hoping to chew up Ephesians tonight, but we had a lot of discussions. I went off note a few times. So, all right. So any questions? Let's give me, I've got a few minutes here. We can wrap up with any questions or comments. <clears throat> That's a good comment about the love. Yes, Mary. Hang on. Let me get, run this to you. 
Oh, the blank for what? The, the, I'll have to go back and look. The revelation of our relationship. A, is it the revelation of our relationship? Anybody online have any comments? Thank you for spending your Valentine's Day with us in the Word of God. This really wasn't a lovey-dovey message, but we don't, we're not pagans either. All right, so we do have the love of Christ, which as far surpasses that. All right, no other questions or comments? All right, well, if you're physically capable, let's stand together and we'll have a word of prayer. And uh, we'll prepare to dismiss then. Thanks for coming. Uh, we'll, next week, we'll jump in after we finish up the condemnation of Ephesus. We'll jump into uh, the next church, uh, which is Smyrna. And then we'll go to uh, Pergamos. So we'll just keep on trucking. I think I got that right, didn't I? The Smyrna number two. I should have, the, yeah, Smyrna. And then Pergamus. I get Sardis confused sometimes. That's why I was second-guessing myself. So they both start with an S. All right. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together tonight. Uh, once again, Lord, we do pray that the things that we do, the work that we do, falls out to the furtherance of the gospel. I pray that we would be industrious like the Church of Ephesus, Lord, that we would also bear uh, and be patient, uh, Lord, as the Church of Ephesus was, that we would be willing to do the work and the labor that you've uh, called the church to, but also, Lord, help us uh, not to forget our first love. Uh, Lord, help us to love your word. They, that was a contentious issue uh, to follow Jesus in Ephesus in the first uh, a few uh, days, weeks, and months was a, a very difficult thing. Uh, and those folks endured a lot to go to the school of Tyrannus and 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 then bear with uh, all the things that they had to deal with just to get the church started. And Lord, help us to remember our love for you, Lord, and help us to be faithful to that. Help us to love your word and not get distracted with all the other nonsense in this world. Uh, Lord, even tonight, Lord, our, our heart grieves for our city. Lord, uh, there, you know, here people are celebrating a great victory uh, in a world sense. And, and it's just a game. It's a child's game. But it's it's fun and it's exciting. And people are trying to enjoy themselves. And it gets uh, just cold water erupts with some sin. Uh, Lord, some sin in our midst. And it's just a picture, Lord, of of exactly uh, what is wrong in this world. There is something wrong with humans, and it's called sin. And Heavenly Father, you put the church here to do the work of ministry. So I pray, God, as we conclude tonight, that we would be about the, the, the love of you, Lord, and the love of others, and we would do the work out of love and, and not labor, uh, because we just feel like we have to out of some duty, uh, Lord, but because we truly love you. And Lord, we'll do so much more work out of love than we will out of some um, some sort of unmet expectations or affirmations that we're trying to earn your love. Lord, help us to just bask in the knowledge that you love us. Here it is, Valentine's Day, and uh, it's about love. And, and that love is, is typically uh, introduced to, to humanity as an erotic love. And yet we have the love of God, uh, which far surpasses that. <clears throat> and Lord, I pray, God, that as we leave here tonight, that we would be filled and full of your love. And Lord, that you would give us that fruit of the Spirit and the peace that passes understanding in a world that uh, is really just uh, looking for love in all the wrong places. And so, Father, I pray, God, that uh, as we go out of here tonight, that we would remember uh, what we've read about Ephesus and we would be a better individual and a better local church because of it and a better partner to other churches because of it. We just thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We uh, hope to see you guys soon.